God, as we now open up your word, we do pray, God, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, not just on my mouth, Lord, as I communicate your heart, but Father, on our ears and on our hearts, that we would have your anointing to receive and respond, Lord, uh, in the affirmative to your truth here today. May we all here now just begin to have an expectation that you, God, are going to speak to us one way or another. So Father, minister to us now in the name of Jesus. Amen. The title of this morning's message is God, the Spirit, and the Church. And so what we've been looking at over the several weeks here now is, you know, what my heart was, it was to introduce God, the Holy Spirit, the person of God, the Spirit to us as a church, you know, that, that he is a, you know, he's a personal God. He's not a radar. He's not some kind of a force, right? He is God and the personhood of God that he fills us. He empowers us. He guides us. And, and he also gifts us, you know, as a church so that we can minister one to another and encourage each each other, right? And um, and last week we looked at the fruit of the spirit. You know, just you know that that uh, that response of us as as people and what that looks like as we live out our Christianity and the fruit of the Holy Spirit and what that's like and the Christ likeness that we that we should be living in as we call ourselves Christians or that we say that we believe in Jesus. But today I want to end with the role of the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the church, because the role of God, the Holy Spirit in the church is like the most important thing. The utmost importance is God's role in um, God, the Holy Spirit's role in the church. The birth of the church, guys, uh, for us is because of him, right? Um, before Jesus, now remember, before Jesus even went to the cross and he died on the cross before that in, in John chapter 14, Jesus told the disciples to, um, you know, that, that it's important for him to go because if he doesn't go, then the helper will not come. He says the helper, Paracletus, God the Spirit will come once he goes to the cross, you see, and so we need the helper. And, and Jesus also said in, in, uh, in his resurrected body in Acts chapter number one and verses, starting right there in verse number five, I believe it is, he talks about, you know, before he ascended, he told the disciples, he said, hey, I want you to go and wait, right? I want you to go and wait for the Holy Spirit to empower them, right? And so the, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, Jesus told the disciples, go and wait, Wait upon the Lord and, and something real quick, I think, you know, God, is, God speaks to a lot of us. God shows us and sometimes, you know, we in our human nature, we don't like to wait. We talked about this last week, right, about long suffering. You know, the, one of the fruits of the Spirit is long suffering and, you know, but God says to go and wait, right? And not just to go and do what we feel, like I've waited long enough, Lord, it's been 10 minutes. No, it doesn't work that way. Wait upon the Lord. And so as they waited upon the Lord, and something, you know, really cool about that as I was thinking is that, you know, the, 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 the obedience of the disciples, they obeyed. They, they were obedient to what God, what Jesus had said, to go and wait. And as they, in their, in their obedience and waiting on God, we know that the Holy Spirit came down, right? It tells us that the Holy Spirit came down, God the helper, and empowered the disciples. And we're told that it was like tongues of fire that came upon the disciples there. And they began to speak in other tongues, right? And and minister the word of God. They were sharing all the wonderful works of God, you know, and, and, and that's what happened. And, and so in Acts chapter two, you know, is when we see that the church was then ignited. You see, the church was ignited because of the power and the work and the person of God, the Holy Spirit, right? And as the church is ignited at that moment, you know, thousands respond at Peter's sermon. Remember that? Peter gave a sermon and, and we're told that thousands of people responded to the message. Friends, as you look, and I want to encourage you to read through and to go through the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a narrative about the birth and the growth of the church. The birth and the growth of the church. Okay? And the work of the Holy Spirit. The birth of and the growth of the church, not just then, but now as the church is continuing to grow, it didn't start because someone had a good idea. 
The birth of the church is not because of an idea that someone had. If the church didn't progress or grow because of some type of program that, that man thought of to do, right? Without the person of God, the Holy Spirit, there would be no church. You see, it's all because of God the Spirit. God the Spirit is the power, my friends, of the church. They're at the birth and the growth and Stephen still now. You know, after centuries and centuries and centuries, it's we, our reliance ought to be as collectively, not just personally, you know, but collectively as a church body on the Holy Spirit, okay? And in Acts, guys, real quick, I'm not going to do a whole full review, but just to kind of get some, get, bring us up to speed on some things here. The church... In Acts is when the church begins, right? Thousands, as I mentioned, hear the gospel and they believe and they, were, and they are saved. We see that not just in Acts chapter 2, but also in Acts chapter number 4 when, when Peter and John, they're, they're filled with the Holy Spirit and, and there was a man there that, that, that God had healed and they began to preach Jesus Right? And we're told that 5,000 people end up getting saved, you know, and they turn to God at that moment, right? And so as we see, as you go on in, into, uh, into Acts, the church, then they, be, they come together. And the Holy Spirit, we're told, began to work mightily within the group of people, within the church body. As a matter of fact, if you would turn to chapter number 5 in the book of Acts, you see, the, the, the book of Acts... Is, we were told in the beginning of chapter number five there that um, Ananias and Sapphira, this husband and wife, you know, the church started coming together and kind of living in a commune type of, you know, way. And, and everybody was selling everything that they had and bringing it all to the, you know, to the church. It wasn't something necessarily that God wanted them or instructed them to do. It was something that they just kind of did naturally. And maybe it worked, you know, for that time. But there was a married couple that said, hey, let's do the same, but let's not sell everything. You know, let's just keep back, you know, some for ourselves and let's just tell everybody else that we did, you know. And so as they did this, the husband comes into, you know, there to the church and, and Peter, God had gifted Peter with the, you know, the, with the word of knowledge. And Peter just addresses, you know, this, this man, the husband says, hey, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? And, you know, he had an opportunity to repent, but he didn't. And because he continued to lie, he dropped dead. And then shortly thereafter, the wife comes and says, and they ask her the same kind of a question. And she died too because she was lying to the Holy Spirit. And guys, you know, what I, the reason why I want to bring that up is because the church the early on was powerful. Why, why I believe was powerful was because there was purity. You know, God, the Holy Spirit was like, man, I want the church to be pure. And there was something powerful that was going on. God had a plan to start this new humanity, as we're going to look at in a second as well. But chapter number 5, look at verse number 12. This is what it says. It says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the church. Notice that believers were increasing. God was just adding to the church. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. Multitudes of both men and women. And so they, so they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and, and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities at, to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were um, tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. You see, God, the Holy Spirit, was working through the church. Mighty things were taking place there. God, the Spirit, was working radically you know, and I believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe that God still wants to do acts, you know, miraculous acts of healings. And, and, and not just, you know, transformations of, of salvation, but also healings and other gifts of the Spirit to be exercised and people responding to the Holy Spirit. Well, then what happens after that surely is that the church began to experience persecution, right? They were being persecuted, and, and when I say persecuted, it's just the church, the Christians weren't just being called names, okay? 
I'm being persecuted at my work. They called me, you know, a name or something. No, it wasn't that. They were actually being thrown into prison. They were being chased out of their, of their cities and homes and, and, and killed even. And in Acts chapter number 7, we read of the, of the first martyr, and that his name is Stephen, and he was killed, you see, and all because of his faith. And he, he shared this sermon, this radical sermon, and people were told that were, they didn't respond, uh, 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 you know, correctly. They didn't respond in saying yes. They responded in wanting to kill him, and that's exactly what happened. Friends, and, and let me share this with you. If it wasn't for the supernatural work of the Spirit... The natural man, this would, have, this would have stopped, you know, if it wasn't, for, if it wasn't a work of the Spirit. Like, in other words, what I'm saying is this. Like, if it was just a good idea, right, and some programs that people said, hey, let's just start the church and let's just do this, let's just see what happens, you know, once people started going to prison and getting killed, they would have said, you know what, dude, it's been good, but we're good. We're not going to do this anymore because people are getting killed. But they didn't stop. They continued. You see, it was a work of the Holy Spirit. Look at what it says in Acts chapter number 7, at verse number 55. This is what it says. You can turn there or um, just listen as I read it. It says this. I'll start at verse number 54. It says, when they heard these things as, as Stephen was preaching the, the, the word and the gospel, as they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at, at him with their teeth but he, Stephen, but he being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and they stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Or when he said this, he died. Listen, did you hear those words? He was full of the Holy Spirit and he said words that Jesus said. Because Jesus said the same thing when he was on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Stephen hears like, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. You see, only a man who's full of the Holy Spirit can say something like this. Right? And, and so here, this is what's going on. This persecution of the church is happening. Now, Acts chapter number 11. I wanted to kind of bring us up to speed on what was going on. In Acts chapter number 11, I'm going to start at verse number 19. And this is what it says. Acts 11, verse 19, says this. Then those who were scattered after the persecution that arose after Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. Please underline that part in your Bibles. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all with, with the purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. That they should remain faithful to the Lord with, with a steadfast purpose. That's what Barnabas was encouraging them with, right? For verse, verse 24, for he was a, Barnabas, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. You see, it was a work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Friends, listen. So just take a look at this right here. The, this persecution, the persecution that was going on resulted in the church being scattered scattered persecution now the world the world would equate persecution really what was going on friends listen is that they the, the church people who were 
putting their faith in Christ, they were being defeated. They were being wiped out. They were being put in prison. They were being persecuted. And now they're, they're running and they're being scattered. In the eyes of the world, this kind of persecution and defeat is failure. It's failure. As a matter of fact, there was a religious leader said, hey, you know what? Let's just see what happens. It's probably going to fizzle out. Nothing's going to come of this because, well, they're being persecuted and they're scattering, right? And that's really, you know, in the eyes of the world, okay, yeah, they're being defeated. It's not going to work, you know? But, but God, I love that phrase. In the eyes of the world, yeah, it looks like defeat. In the eyes of the world, they're being persecuted. It's not going to work. But God, but God, I love that quote or that those two words, but God will use, God will use persecution. God will use, even use what seems to be like defeat as an opportunity as for success. Amen. He will. And now when I say that, my friends, I'm not talking about, oh, you know, the persecution and, and, and defeat as an opportunity for success because sometimes we today think of success in monetary terms, right? Money and things, stuff, you know, status. Man, I'm successful, you know. That's the eyes of the world sees success in that way. Not success like that. Success in the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I hope and pray that, that that's your passion that you see success as God is doing great things in our world and the platforms in which God has given to you, wherever it is that you are, wherever it is that you work, that you're gonna be like, man, you know, God is gonna give me success here to preach the gospel and to do good things and to minister, to bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. You see, when God the Spirit is leading, that's exactly what would happen. When God the Holy Spirit is leading you, leading us in our lives, regardless of the persecution, with regardless of what may be going on in life, God was, is going to get the glory and there will, be, there will be an advancement of his kingdom. Somehow, some way. How is it going to look? I don't know. All I do know is that it says this. Write this reference down in your Bibles. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 that verse says, all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. Let me tell you some, something, friends. I don't always understand when, when God is doing things. But I do know this, that God is able to take our tragedies, our failures, our pains, our hurts and our sorrows for his glory. When we surrender to him, he's able to take it and make something beautiful out of it. He's able to do, you know, do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think when we surrender it to him. All things work together for good. I don't know how that works. There's been times when I've been asked as a pastor, hey, pastor, would you, you know, what's going on? Or, you know, why? Asking me why, I don't know. It can be something very, very tragic. But I do know this, even in the most tragic event that might take place, if it's surrendered over to God completely, all things work together for good. I don't know what it's gonna look like. I don't know how it's gonna turn out, but I know that it's gonna work for good when it's surrendered in his hands. And let me tell you something, friends, probably during the time of this persecution as these Christians, we don't even know the names of them, right? But they're being scattered. They're being run out. They're being driven out that they have to go and hide. And they're, they're going, you know, here, as it says, to Cyprus and Cyrene. They're probably thinking, man, I don't know what's going on. But what good came out of this? Let me tell you something. A spiritual awakening was taking place as a result of this persecution. A spiritual awakening. Do you know what that means? That means people that, that were dead in their sin. It means people that were living their life in darkness, searching for truth because these Christians are now being scattered. They're going to these places right here and they settled down right there in Macedonia and now they're hearing the gospel that's opening the ears of their heart. The scales of their eyes are falling and they're coming to faith in Christ. All things work together for good. Even that persecution that was taking place the advancement of the gospel and a spiritual awakening was taking place. 
You see, that was God the Holy Spirit directing and leading. And friends, we don't always understand why or what's going on with in God's plans. And then in verses 22 and 24, news of this awakening traveled to the leaders there in Jerusalem, right? And we see, we read here that Barnabas, you know, he was saying, hey, Barnabas, why don't you go over there to that church there in, um, in Antioch and see what's going on? And Barnabas, we know he's, he's a.k.a. his nickname is Son of Encouragement. He was an encourager. He had the gift of encouragement. He was, we're told here in the scriptures that he was full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of the Spirit. What does that mean? What does that look like for a person to be full of the Holy Spirit? Are, are they going to like have an extra glow about them? You know, are they going to glow in the dark? You know, remember those glow in the dark stickers and stuff like that? You know, is, is that what that means? That's, that's not what it means. You know, full of the Holy Spirit in a simple way, guys. It means a person who's going to live his or her life with a purpose to glorify and please Jesus. Full of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, remember, is to bring glory to God. It's to direct people to Jesus and glorify the name of Jesus. And when you are, when we are, are full of the Holy Spirit, that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to have a desire and a passion to please Jesus in all that you do. Right? To bring glory to the name of God. And, and uh, when you're full of the Holy Spirit. So this is this man. This is Barnabas. And he had this gift of encouragement. You know, and this gift of encouragement is a natural gift. You know, just to, to someone to encourage him. And it's not like the kind of encourage. You see, the encouragement here that, that the Bible talks about is the encouragement to, to continue your walk in the Lord, like encourage a person to follow Jesus. Encourage a person, you know, to know God, right? And, and that's really the, the major encouragement there because once we receive that encouragement, everything else is going to follow. You know, you, I, get the, I get the encouragement to follow after Jesus and to, you know, just love on the Lord. Well, you know, it's going to trickle down. I'm going to, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect my marriage. It's going to affect everything else as I respond to that encouragement. And see, this is who Barnabas was. He was an encourager. And what's really interesting here is that what you don't have, it, you don't see an official position for anybody, you know, and, and, you know, to actually be this kind of encourager, you know? It's not like, okay, um, you know, yeah, well, all, that's the encouragement is, well, pastors and the ministry leaders, they're the ones that are to encourage everybody. And that's not how it works, you know, that's, we, you know, you can encourage me, you know, we can encourage one another. You can encourage people at your workplace and not so much, I'm not saying, hey, encourage them. Hey, come on guys, we can work better. That's not, that's, that's a good thing too, but encouragement, hey, let me encourage you that somebody loves you. Let me tell you who that somebody is. You know, you can encourage them and, and bring them to know God. That's what's important. You see, and so every one of us ought to be and should be full of God, the Holy Spirit. You see, and remember, being full of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that you're glowing in the dark. It means that, man, I have a passion to please Jesus in all that I do and to glorify his name. And so not only were they encouraged here, the church body, but we see that many people were added to the church. Did you see that right there? Many people were added because of what was going on. It was a work of the Holy Spirit that was going on. It, it was, that was, that's it. Remember, friends, the church, as we're told in Ephesians, in chapter number 2 and verse number 15, that the church is a new humanity. Okay, it's a new humanity, a new man. Ephesians chapter 2, 15 says that, you know, really the idea there is that, that God came, you know, Jesus died on the cross, you know, to knock those barriers down so that Jews and Gentiles can have this oneness, a new humanity, a new man, right? And that new man really is the church. That's us, 
Okay, that's us. And as this new, and God just doesn't leave us there as, uh, you know, that's it. You know, we have to figure things out all on our own collectively. No, God, what does, what does he do? Remember, the Holy Spirit, the helper has come alongside. The Holy Spirit came to empower us, to be about his business, to fill us, the Holy Spirit, to fill us and to lead us and empower us to be about God's business and to live with a Christ-likeness. See, that's the work of God's Holy Spirit in the church. Friends, listen. Without God, without God the Holy Spirit, okay, now listen. The church is just a a social club. Without God, the Holy Spirit, the church is just just a club, just something that we do, a place where people come to feel better about themselves. Without God, the Holy Spirit. And the unfortunate thing is that many people come to church just for that purpose. I go to church, it makes me feel better about myself. It's not the purpose of the church at all. The purpose of the church is is so that we can have a place where if we need to be convicted by God, the Holy Spirit, we're going to confess our sin. We're going to encourage one another. We're going to be praying for one another. You see, and and, and we're going to be speaking life into one another and and do life with, with one another. Without God, the Holy Spirit, listen, preaching is just a feel good speech. Without God, the Holy Spirit. Without God, the Holy Spirit, the preaching and the teaching of God, like on Sunday mornings or in the midweek or whenever the Bible is being opened, without God, the Holy Spirit, it just becomes informational and not transformational. My friends, please, it's not about just gathering information. You know, yeah, we should be growing in our understanding and and, and, and the doctrine of, you know, of biblical doctrine. But that shouldn't stop there. It should be transforming our lives to be more like Christ. If you're not living your life, if you can't, if, if you're like, man, my life really hasn't changed in the past five years. I still do the things I've been doing, but I like, I like to come to church. I'm going to encourage you. What's, what's up? What's going on? Because there should be a transformation that's taking place. See, and, and my friends, we need the Holy Spirit as a preacher, as someone who preaches, as someone who, you know, communicates the gospel. I need the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God's Holy Spirit to speak through me. But it's not, doesn't end there. See, some of you are like, yeah, man, we, we pray that you get anointed. Well, I pray you get anointed. That your ears, that the ears of your heart are anointed to receive all that God has. And I want to, I ask you, do you pray? Do you pray that God would open the ears of your heart? That you would hear him? That you would hear God speak directly to your life? Do you ever pray that when you're, you know, walking in, you know, driving up to on a Sunday service or midweek or you're about to listen to a Bible teaching on the radio? God, would you speak to me directly? I need, I need the anointing of your word right now because I'm hurting, because I'm sad, because I have, I have questions and I have concerns and I'm confused. Because I feel like I'm going to give up. See, many people, many people in the church have those feelings of giving up, of, of just, ah, forget it. And then they just give up without, without going to God and asking God. See, we need that. I need that. We all need the anointing of God to hear that. And that's through the work of his spirit. And I pray, you know, one way to, one thing to pray, one way to pray is pray that God gives the humility, the humility in your life, that God will give you the humility to respond to his truth. The reason why many people don't respond to the truth of God is because of pride, It's because, well, that's just not how I am, people say. I'm not like that. I don't do that. Or I just had this pride and it's like, oh, you know, and then you're not responding to what you know that God is calling you to respond to because you can sense it, but you fight it off. How many guys know what I'm talking about? You see, I know that. Oh man, when the invitation comes to get up out of the seat and maybe to come forward, I know he's gonna do that. And you have that tug, I want to get up, but I don't want to get up. I don't want people to see me. 
Trust me, people ain't looking at you. And the, and the thing is, is that we shouldn't really be concerned about what, what people see. We should be concerned about what God sees because God sees it all. He sees it. He sees it all. And he hears it all. See, without God, the Holy Spirit, an outreach is just a concert. Without God, the Holy Spirit, an outreach is just a man's effort to do something cool. And trust me, I've been there and I've done that. And I've repented from that because there's been outreaches that I've been a part of and we've done. And it's just like at the end, we, you know, week goes by. It's like, why did we even do that? Why did we spend all that money for, for what? What was it? What was it for? You know, time and effort and money. And what was it for? You know, it's like, man, that was just an, an effort out of the flesh. We need the direction of the Holy Spirit of God. Because we feel that God maybe wants to do something and do something radical. And so, yes, we need the power and the work and the person of the Holy Spirit even to do an outreach. Without God the Holy Spirit, friends, in the church, without God the Holy Spirit in the church, we just we rely on strategies and past revivals. That's what happens you know, I, have a, I was talking to a young person earlier in the week and, you know, they were just talking about how, um, you know, just going to different churches and, you know, kind of like, you know, I was asking, well, what's your walk with the Lord like? And they're like, ah, well, it's kind of like we're kind of looking for churches and, you know, um, we went to a couple of churches and we heard that these different bands or these different groups are going to be doing their gigs there and everything. And I'm talking, I said, hold on, time out. So you're, you're, you went to church where they're doing gigs? He's like, yeah, that's what they're calling gigs. I'm like, bro, well, there's a big problem right there. That's a strategy. That's man's effort, you know? Well, what is it? And, and he goes on to share that, you know, yeah, well, you know, the kind of places that they're looking for is like, you know, places that are really relevant, you know, and very hip. And they got the, they got the, the smoke screen, the smokes and the lights and all. And I'm not saying that smoke and, and lights are bad in and of themselves. But when that becomes the strategy of the church to draw people in so they can be a part of a social club, so they can say, man, that was cool. I had fun. That was like a good concert level type of music. Let me tell you something. The church then is missing something. And this is where I see and I feel the church church is hurting today because many people are chasing it seems that without the leading and the direction of God the Holy Spirit the the church was birthed because of the Holy Spirit we need to continue to rely as a church rely on God, the Holy Spirit, not on schemes or strategies of man, but on God, the Spirit, not on past revivals that took place, you know, 60 years ago or 50 years ago or whatever, right? There is an anointing of God, the Holy Spirit, in planning. And so I'm not saying that we shouldn't plan. We should plan, and we need to rely on God, the Holy Spirit, to direct us in the planning because God is the God of order. And I believe that God wants us to continue with that even in our planning. However, we need the Spirit of God. And we can also celebrate the past work of God and the revivals. You know, the Azusa revival, we can look at. I, I pray, I encourage you, read books on that. They're fascinating. I love it. You know, even with the Jesus People Movement, and, you know, Pastor Greg Laurie, he came out with a book on the, you know, that Jesus People Movement not too long ago, about a year ago, and, and he just made an announcement that they're going to make a movie about it. And that's good. These are good things to celebrate. But my friends, we can't ride on the coattails or on the little ripples of a past revival. Yesterday's revival can easily become today's religion. We need to pray and seek for a fresh work of the Spirit. Did you guys get that? Yesterday's revival can easily become today's religion. We need to pray and seek for a fresh work of God, the Holy Spirit, within the church. Within the church. The church doesn't belong to us. 
Remember that church is not of a building with four walls and a steeple at the top. That's just a building. The church is us. Right? Ecclesia. In Spanish, iglesia. It means called out ones. That's who we are. Right? You and I are the church. It's not a building. And it's, so it's us. We need to continue to seek that and to pray after that. For a fresh work of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I feel, I sense in my heart. I don't know if you sense this, friends. But I do. I feel like God wants to do something great. And I'm seeking that. And I'm asking, I'm asking the Lord. You know, God's been giving me like just ideas and vision for about a year now. You know, and I'm praying about them because I don't want to have a knee-jerk reaction and go out and do them because I want to make sure, God, are you leading? Are you doing something? Is it something fresh? Is it something new? Is it something different that you want to do in my life, right, for the expansion of the kingdom of God? Did you know that most of the ministry that I get to do as a pastor is outside the church body? Really, it truly is. Outside within school district. Right? City officials, you know, police department, just going out and, and ministering and sharing and, and letting people know about God. I'm not like, hey, I'm a pastor, so I think you should listen. I don't do that. It's like, hey, man, you know, what's up? What's going on? And the next thing you know, I'm in the back of my mind, I'm in the barber shop and I'm sitting and getting my hair cut from this, from a, you know, new barber that don't know me and everything. And, and it's just like, I'm like, okay, Lord, give me the opportunity to talk about God, you know, talk about you. Sure enough, guess what he asked me? So what do you do for a living? <laughs> oh, I'm a pastor. Oh, wow. So you do that all the time? Yeah. Wow. So you don't look like a pastor. I don't know what a pastor's supposed to look like. Maybe I should start wearing that collar. No? Okay. Yeah. No, I won't. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it opens the door. Guys, that, that's what God's called us to do. And so I'm constantly praying, God, would you give not just me, but it's for us as a church body. What is it that he wants to do in our lives? We need to depend on him. And God will use tragedies. God will use heartaches. God will use hurts. God will use pains. God will even use our confusion of, I don't know why we're doing this, God, but, as we're, but we're, we're trusting you. God then will do something great. Nothing that took place in Acts chapter number 11 was the work of man. Nothing that took place that here in Acts chapter number 11 here was a work of man. Prior to this, in, in chapters like in, you know, 9 and 10, you know, we see you know, uh, Philip is going out and he's sharing the gospel with someone who's reading the word with an Ethiopian, right? And then we see that Peter in chapter number 10 gets this vision to go out and to share the gospel to Cornelius who was, um, he was a, a Roman soldier, a centurion, a man of, you know, respect and, and, and um, you know, um, position, right? And he was seeking God. And then we have this as the church is being scattered. All this is taking place, right? And, and as we see this, this, not a, this man can't come up with this. If man was in charge of all of this, they'd be like, hey, you know what, dude, we're getting killed. So we're, gonna, we're just going to go to Antioch. We're going to call it quits because we don't want to die no more. You know what I mean? So, hey, what do you guys think? Cool? All right, yeah, cool. Hey, peace out, man. It was a good two weeks, but I'm good, bro. You know, that's the work of man. But the work of the Spirit and God working, you know, in this tragedy, in, this, in them being persecuted and scattered, he begins to, he plants a church. God does, right? And God was working in this way. All things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called for it, to his purposes. All things work together for good. And the good is this, that the gospel began to go out to the, to the rest of the world from Antioch. Because Antioch, this place, became the home base, if you will, for, for, the, um, for the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys. It became the home base, right? And from this place, from this place, the gospel was going out into the world. Antioch was the third largest city there in the, the region of Rome, in the Roman Empire, 
right? It was a place of commerce. It was a place where it was happening and a lot of other religions and idolatry was taking place, you know? And so it was, a, and all, we shared about some of the religions and, and the, the idolatry that was taking place, you know, just drunkenness, party life, sexual promiscuity and immorality was going on. You know, that was, that was it. And this is where God sent the church in Antioch became the home base for these missionary journeys, right? And as missionaries, what do they want? Missionary, it goes out into the world. In John chapter three, verse number 16, God says, for, he says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, the plan of God is for the whole world to come to faith. That when they believe in him, they will not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the plan of God. And let me tell you something, friends. That's what God is charging us and encouraging us with to do as a church, to share that wonderful message of the cross. There is no substitute, friends. There is no substitute for God the Holy Spirit in the church. No substitute. And as I already mentioned, you know, many people and people who are in leadership positions are neglecting the leading and the guiding and the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in their life. And not just in their life, but for a church body. And they're looking to programs. They're looking to, well, how can we do this, you know, uh, um, you know schemes. Schemes and programs and all this other stuff, you know, strategies. How can we do this? And like it's a corporation. I don't know, but if you look at, there are some churches that are out there in this world now that that's what they look like. They look like corporations. They're just like, what's really going on? What's the substance? Like if it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, well then I don't know. You know, they go and critique and this guy was telling me, hey, yeah, you know, I've been to a couple churches and I'm kind of just like, uh, you know, kind of just not... I don't know if I'm jiving, you know, I'm, I, I'm like kind of critiquing everything that's, oh, that was wrong and that was wrong. That doesn't look good. And, you know, so kind of looking at, let me tell you something, man. You go to any church and you start to critique, you're going to find a lot of things wrong. It's not, it's not, it's not us. It's not the person, right? I can't save you. I can't, you know, I can't. I can do my best to encourage you and to help you and, you know, what I can do. But really, I'm going to point you to Jesus, my friends. I can't save you. The praise and worship team can't do it, you know. The ushers can't do it. The security team, they really can't do it. (laughs) And what I'm saying is none of us can. It's God. It's God. And it's God working in us as a church, the Holy Spirit, to go out into the world to share that. And we should not neglect the Holy Spirit of God as there are some churches and ministries that that's exactly what they're doing and they're looking to their programs and their strategies instead of relying on the person of God, the Spirit. The church, we, the church, needs to emphasize the gospel because it's through this message of the cross That God the Holy Spirit transforms lives from death to life. The gospel message, the message of the cross. The Bible is very clear. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. To those who are perishing. It's like, man, that's stupid. The cross, Christians, Jesus. To those who are perishing, it is foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And we cannot communicate that message Clearly, if we do not, if we are not relying as a church and as individuals on the person of God, the Holy Spirit. Because, my friends, listen, it's through the work and power of God, the Holy Spirit, that addictions are broken. Amen? It's through God the Holy Spirit that addictions are broken. It's through God the Holy Spirit that marriages are restored. It's through God and the work of the Holy Spirit that that the sick are healed. That the confused that are living their life in so much confusion receive clarity. It's through the work of God's Holy Spirit. It's not through me. It's not through anybody else but God the Spirit. 
It's only the work of God the Spirit that can bring people from a different background, from different races and cultures and social and education and economic statuses together to worship and live for Jesus. And you see that here in the last verse of chapter, um, not the last verse actually, but in verse number 20, 26, it says that they were there in Antioch was the very first place that all these people groups are called Christians. The first place that Christians are called Christians is in Antioch. There in the current day Syria. That's where it was. You see, it's only God, the Holy Spirit, that can bring people together from different walks of life. My friends, listen. The world is hungry. The world is thirsty. The world is searching, young and old. Young elementary school, junior high and high school students are searching for something that's real, that's authentic, that's true. They're searching for love and acceptance. But it's not just youngsters. It's adults as well. Young men. You know the suicide rate between, of, of young men is like at the it skyrocketed, like between the ages of like, I believe it's like 17 and 25. Skyrocketed. What are they looking for? They're looking for something that we got as a church, as a people of God. And what are we doing? And I'm not just talking about us, my friends. I'm talking about as a church. Why is it, it just feels like, and seems like sometimes People that say they go to church and call themselves Christians are fine with going to church like one and a half hours once a week on a Sunday morning. Like they, well, I, 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 that's it, isn't it? No. It's every day. It's a lifestyle. It's how I live my life. I don't want to give in to my flesh. I don't want to do all these other things. I want to live my life for Jesus. My friends, when we are doing this, people out there in this world are seeing that and, they're come, and they'll come to you because why? You, you are relying on God the Spirit and we are relying on God the Holy Spirit as a church and it's that, that there's something in us. It's that love. It's that joy. It's that peace that passes all understanding that we can't really explain it but all I can tell you is that man, God loves us and God loves you right where you're at and perhaps that's where you're at today. You feel broken, you feel sad, you feel hurting. Or maybe God right now in the work of his Holy Spirit is putting his finger on your sin because it's the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. And maybe there's some sin. Maybe you've been backsliding. Maybe you've been living your life in the flesh. And God's got his finger on it, not to hurt you, but to call you out and, to say, and, and with his love and grace, say, hey, would you confess of this thing or these things? And would you repent of it? Because I have a plan for you, a plan of joy and of peace, a plan that's gonna change your life. See, God, the Holy Spirit, he breaks down the barriers that our world seems to be so caught up in and the divisiveness and the division that our world is in. If you're not a part of this group, well, then I don't want to hear you. You know, this group or that group, it's just it's so divided. Guys, we are the answer. The church, God's people, that's who we are. Look very quick at that verse. I asked you to underline verse 21. And I'm ending now. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. The hand of the Lord was with them. It's a work of God. It's not our work. It's not my work. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. May we as a church have a reliance on God, the Holy Spirit. Amen? God, we thank you for your message of truth your message of love and your message of power. And I pray, Father, that you would minister to us, that we would be a church with a passion to live a life of purity, not given in to wine, addictions, 
sexual immorality, pride, jealousies, those things, Lord, as we understood last week, are all the works of the flesh. We want to walk in the Spirit. And we need you because, Lord, a world is hurting out there. And we believe, Lord, that you want to use us. You want to, you want to use your people to make an impact in the lives of people that you sent your son to die for. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.